Welcome to the Cosmic Pie Podcast, episode number 37. I'm your host, Wayne Barcos, and with me as usual is... Robert Moore. Robert, we are streaming, as you know, live from the University of North Dakota. That's it. Grand Forks, where we went from fall to winter in, yeah. in a week. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Yeah. So what'd you think of that? I thought that was kind of crazy, to be honest. Uh, I don't think I've... Two years I've been up here, I don't think I've seen a transition quite that drastic. I think even from the people that live around here, it was a little off guard for everybody. Right. I mean, I mean, we went from warmer than normal to seasonal practically overnight. Yeah. So it's amazing. So I know on, like on the weekend or whatever that we had, what, up to like a half a foot of snow. Right. And for those of you who are, you know, are in the metric system, if you're from Canada or other countries, still have a foot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, Canada uses imperial land metric, don't they? Yeah, I mean, if you like, on a, informally, we use the imperial system, and then informally, it's the metric system. So it's a real mix of, of uh, units in that sense, right? So one of the things we like to say at the very beginning, of course, is that if you have any comments or questions that you'd like to ask us during the po- uh, podcast, feel free to use the chat feature. Yep. And also, anything that we say, Robert, would you like to uh, continue that? Well, I we could, we'll continue with our disclaimer. They are the sole opinions of myself and Wayne. They are not the opinions of the state can, uh, state of North Dakota. State of Canada, you were going to say? Yeah, state, state of something. Of, I'm, state of confusion. State of confusion, <laughs> yeah. You know, I got my degree from Catatonic U. <laughs> <laughs> Catatonic state. I yeah. bought mine online. <laughs> oh, okay. As you can tell, we're going to have a little fun today. It is folks. Halloween. It is Halloween. So you got to get crazy and scary uh-huh. and spooky all in one, right? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> like I said, we're we're on a roll today. <laughs> anyway, disclaimer. Yes. Right. That there are any opinions expressed are ours and ours alone. So, there we go. And so. Not to be political, but if there's anything that we did say that you don't like, uh, just, you know, put Trump in jail or something for it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and good afternoon to you as well, Mizuho. Now, for the last several podcasts, we did have guests. And mm-hmm. when we have guests, we usually try to keep the conversation, if you like, tuned to what the guests are uh, known for in terms of their specialty. Right. And Which, keeping it a little more conversational than what we normally even do. Exactly. We like to get their opinion on various subjects and so on. But because we have guests, that prevents us from looking at things that are occurring now, sort of in the news, if you like, recent right. current events, right, related to astronomy and science in general. And so there have been a number of items which we're going to go through today just because it gives us an opportunity to catch up a little bit. Although mm-hmm. these are all stories that, you know, that are relatively recent. So the first one today that we're going to look at is the recent paper that come out, came out to describe basically the, if you like, the increased in an abundance of what we call helium-3 relative to helium-4. Right. So this was detected from rocks that were analyzed uh, from Baffin Island in Canada. If you want to go to the next slide. Okay. That kind of gives you a perspective of what it looks like. So on the right, we have an image of Baffin Island. So this is in northern Canada. And you can see, you know, it looks beautiful, right? I mean, you can picture yourself hiking in that area. Oh, yeah. Or, Probably a great place to hike, except for, you know, all that white stuff. Well, there's other other white stuff that's around that you have to watch out for if you are hiking. Yeah, that white stuff has teeth. That's right. And also <laughs> has four legs, i.e. Right. Like polar bears. Polar bears. So you have to watch out for that. But, you know, it's, it's really, you know, pristine land, right? Absolutely. And one of the things you'll notice is that Baffin Island is part of what we call the Canadian Shield. So you're looking at really old... Old rocks. Old rocks. Old rocks. You know, some of these rocks are billions of years old that's been yes. reworked. And so... It's what in geology we call a craton. Okay. Yeah. So Robert, in case you don't know, he <laughs> has a lot of expertise in planetary science. So any of the geology type of things, I rely on him to provide <laughs> uh, expert commentary rather than uh-huh. himself that would just make it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I make up some of it, no. <laughs> so the study that you see here was uh, published recently, and basically it looks at the abundance of helium-3 versus helium-4. So in the most abundant form, helium-4, what we mean by that, if you think of a single atom of helium, because it's helium, it has two protons in the nucleus, and usually with that, there will be two neutrons in the nucleus, and then if it's 
you know, a neutral form of the atom would be two electrons in the outskirts of the nucleus to make up the helium atom. But of course, we can have what's called different isotopes of atoms. And for those who don't know, different isotope would be the same type of element in terms of the number of protons, in this case two, but it could have different numbers of neutrons. Right. So helium-3 in this case would be a helium atom that has one less neutron. And if you add up the total number of protons and the total number of neutrons, instead of being four, it would be three. three. And helium-3 is rare. Helium-3 is really rare. You see, helium-4 can come from all kinds of radioactive breakdown of materials like uranium and thorium and so forth. Uh, or, or it can be come from the sun itself. It, it gives off as part of its solar wind some yeah. helium-4. And even going f much further back in time than that, we know helium was produced in the Big Bang that created right. our universe. So the most abundant element is hydrogen, but the second most abundant is helium. Is helium. And most of that would have been in the form of helium-4. Helium-4, yep. And so what is interesting about this study is that the helium-3, as far as geologists can tell, and Robert, you can yep. correct me if I'm wrong on this line of thinking, this helium-3 has seeped out from the deep interior of the Earth itself. Right, and it had to have been there pretty much since the formation of the Earth because it would not go down... It would only be coming up. Helium, one of the lightest gases, so it's going to come up, not drop into the middle. Yeah. And so there's going to be some fraction of the helium that's in the, you know, back four and a half billion years ago in the pre solar nebula, the, mm -hmm. the interstellar material that ultimately give rise to the formation of both our sun and the rest of our solar system. There'll be a certain abundance of that helium three. Right. And the idea is that you can lock away that helium-3 in different ways, like having it trapped in the deep interior of a newly forming planet, for example. Right. And any helium-3 that escapes has to make its way eventually to the surface. And, of course, that, Robert, would be like some type of geological process. Right. For... I, I, I was going to say, you know, uh, I've got a picture here of what we call a xenolith. That green stuff is olivine. That's what the mantle of the earth is made out of. And the black is, of course, basalt lava rock. And the olivine is incredibly per impervious to uh, um, uh, diffusion of gases. And unlike what a lot of people think, the mantle of earth is solid. It's little green crystals like that. And so going back to the Baffin Island, it's a prettier picture in my opinion. Um, so the helium isn't going to diffuse. So any that was trapped in the rocks as the Earth settled and formed was going to pretty much remain set, uh, settled. And as for the convection of the mantle, which is what would have brought it to the surface, uh, think of a sand pile moving, because as you saw, that little green crystals, right? So essentially the mantle is like this big sand dune, and it's slowly percolating kind of like sand dunes being blown by the wind. Right. So Now that yeah. helium-3 can also come up through like volcanism, through right? Volcanism. And plate tectonics, I assume. Right. Generally speaking, the, the mantle is turning over at about three centimeters per year, but there are hot spots like underneath Hawaii or Iceland where it comes up, relatively speaking, at very high rates of speed. And so those hot spots are where a lot of the helium-3 is outgassing because it's been brought up to the surface. And so one of the interesting measurements, <clears throat> I assume, is you want to be able to measure this sort of isotopic ratio, the, the mm -hmm. ratio of helium-3 to helium-4. And what you like to have is a pristine primordial sample. Primordial means if you could sample the pre-solar ne uh, nebula to get what the abundance was like before our solar system altered things. Right. And so that would be what's trapped inside the deep interior, even down as far as the core. So if you want to go to the very first slide that we okay. have up there, that's what the, 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 uh, the um, artist's drawing on the right represents, <laughs> is that this material could have ultimately came from the core region itself. Come from the core, right. And that's definitely one explanation. Um, I, mean, I mean, one would think that all this gas, the turning over of the mantle through its convection and everything, the blowing of that sand pile, uh, would have outgassed all of this primordial helium-3. But here it is coming up from deep nano plumes in Hawaii and Iceland. And here it is trapped in the rocks, the olivine, 
that just makes up Baffin Island. Right. So, yeah, uh, where is it coming from? And the answer may indeed be the core. So by sampling the helium-3, then, that's trapped in the olivine in these rocks on Baffin Island, that gives you closer to the primordial ratio of helium-3 to helium-4. Right, which gives you a clue how the Earth formed, in what order it formed, when, when consolidation of the core, all the metals, iron and iron, gold, and all that sank to the center. And it, it, this is how indirectly we do poke at something we can't see or lay our hands on, is we look at these isotopic ratios. We look at uh, the, the composition of older rock, like on Baffin Island and in these various cratons that are throughout the world. And this is how it's done. We, we piece together from what we know of the properties of these rocks, and we work backwards to what that means had to have happened to produce those rocks and those chemical compositions. And it's, it's a great chain of events, but there's a lot of gaps. And it's interesting to note that the ratios that they're f they find, that they report in this uh, recent paper, that ratio, as you see there in the abstract, if you can read that, that's 67 Seven times, times greater than what you see by measuring in the atmosphere of the Earth. Right. Well, helium-3 is going to be, is lighter, so it's going to escape from, all helium escapes from Earth's gravity. Right. Helium-3 would escape even faster because it's even lighter. I mean, it's three-quarters of the weight. Right, so, and in fact, helium was first detected, do you know? Uh, helium was first detected in the sun through spectral lines, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. It was first yeah. detected on the sun. In fact, that's where the name helium comes from, ah, helium right. Helios. in the sun. Yeah. Yep. So the next question you have is, you know, if you're using helium-3 versus helium-4, which one makes you sound the funniest? I don't think that would matter <laughs> because... <laughs> I'm sure helium-3 is more expensive than helium-4. I'm quite sure, So too. if you have balloons and you want to put helium in it, it's probably better to select, if you have a, have a choice, have select helium-4. Yeah. I, I mean, it's better that way, too, because if we ever going to get uh, huge fusion power generation, chances are it's going to be by fusing helium-3 into helium-4. Right. Well, one of the, the uh, justification going back to the moon is the fact that the moon's surface has a high abundance of helium-3. Due to spallation from cosmic rays and right. solar wind. Exactly. So the surface of the soil or regolith of the moon is exposed directly to the solar wind coming from the sun and also from cosmic ray impact, which produces the helium-3. So, in fact, one of the first exper one of the experiments, I think, during the Apollo 11 mission was to open up a foil and, and that exposed happened. it to that, those um, particles coming from the sun for the production of the helium-3. Okay. And then they fold that I up and bring it back to Earth and analyze. That. That's cool. And that's how they got the direct measurement of what is the amount of helium-3 that gets produced per square meter, let's say, on the surface of the moon. Okay. You know, in some period of time, a year, let's say. And yeah. they could use that, you know. Yes. It's a very uh, valuable resource. I, I mean, you got to think of it. Uh, this, the, it's the solar wind blows at uh, several hundred kilometers per second. So, you know... These particles have a lot of energy. They slam into things and they bust it up. That's one of the problems with how do you protect astronauts from that sort of thing. Right. If you're justifying going back to the moon. Yeah, we've got to protect them for a long time. Well, you have to justify the money that's going to be spent. That's it's going to be a lot of money. So you're always looking for things like this, right? right. I mean, you're not going there for the fish. You're not going there for the, <laughs> for the deer. You know, this no. kind of stuff. You're yeah. going there for things like helium-3. You know? And oddly enough, you're not going there for the metals because the moon is relatively metal poor compared to Earth. So what are you going there for? Helium-3 and um, all these other things that you just can't get on Earth as readily. Yeah, for sure. So that, so, well, that was an interesting. In fact, this actually ties into what was the conditions like and the nebula that ultimately turned into our solar system. Right. And you think about all the different, you know, changes that have occurred in that material to where we see it today around us. You want to be able to look at something that's as pristine and primordial as possible to get a more direct measurement of what the early solar system was like roughly four and a half billion years ago. Yep. And this is just one way of doing that. And, and in fact, that's another thing we look at when we're looking at these meteorites that fall is we're looking for conditions that say it was altered by water 
or it was altered by exposure to oxygen or air, or it was altered by temperature. And yeah, uh, I mean, you've got to look out for all of these things and correct for them or say, hey, our results are in doubt because of these. Exactly. Now, thinking about geology, and we think yeah. about asteroids, in fact, you can make that argument with Bennu that that's one of the reasons why you bring back uh, bring regolith samples. samples from Bennu is to look at, see how pristine that material is, and I'll mm -hmm. give you clues about what the early condition of the solar system was all about. Right. But speaking about asteroids, there's been a recent study that's been published, and this is the next slide, Robert, if you want to turn to that. And this involves the asteroid that supposedly wiped out the dinosaurs. Definitely gave them a good boot out the door. Now, did you have you seen the movie that's come out fairly recently, within a year or so, called 65? I have not. Okay, so no. it's about like 65 million years ago, so it was about the asteroid that okay. hit the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, and these humans crashed on the surface of the Earth. They weren't from the Earth at around just before <laughs> the asteroid impact, so they're like fighting the dinosaurs on how the asteroid hits or it's on its way, and they got to get out of there. It's all this kind of storyline, right? Wow. But, if you, but notice if you read the literature... Some people are saying, you know, 65 million years and 66 million years. So 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were wiped out. But some people are using the number I noticed, 66 million years. Mm -hmm. And then one story I was reading recently said 65 and a half million years. Right. So they come right down the line. So there must be some, is there some slop in that determination? Oh, of that? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that determination is made due to radioactive elements that are in a worldwide layer called the KT boundary. It's higher in iridium, which is common, uh, rare on Earth, but common in asteroids. Most of the iridium got pulled down into the, our core with the iron. And so any iridium layer like that is almost certainly due to a, an impact, an impactor. And since this is worldwide, it's a worldwide, it's a big impactor. Anyway, so there was also been some uranium, thorium, and things like that in with that that was brought by the asteroid. And they date it by seeing how much uranium is left versus how much lead, the end product of lead, or uranium's radioactivity, is there. And the assumption is made that any lead present came from the uranium. Now, this is why you don't take one measurement, you take measurements from all over the world and you take hundreds of measurements from each location, but they all point to roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 65 million years ago. Right. So the um, Chicxulub crater, which is Chicxulub you know, crater, sort of yeah. just off of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, mm -hmm. that has been pointed at as probably the possible impact site of the asteroid that wiped <coughs> out the, essentially wiped out the dinosaurs. Right. And that's basically underwater, right? So it was underwater mapping of the, what's left over the crater rim, if I'm not mistaken. Most of it is in the Gulf of Mexico. Right. There is a section of it that is in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Uh, it was actually first identified, uh, I forget the name of the mission, but uh, the, the satellite mission that's mapping the gravitational field of Earth. And they noticed an anomaly. And they went in and they've mapped it with ground-based tools even more precisely, and it's a crater. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. You can see the rings uh, due to the density changes, and you can see a central peak due to the density changes that affect the, the gravitational pull. Right, so the size of the crater... Is 150 miles, I want to say. So it's large enough that would be this, where 75% of Earth species went extinct... After Absolutely. this event. This, this was a huge thing. Uh, and it has an age that's been estimated to be right in that time period. Has, it's estimated to be in that time period. And not only that, but there are materials there that are found that are found in that KT layer that I mentioned. And what are you going to conclude? You've got the same materials. You've got an impact that's about the same age. Yeah, this is it. So if you want to go to the next slide, we can actually see there's... So the paper itself is based on the fact that people are always trying to understand uh, what is the details of what happened after the impact. So we know it's been associated with the extinction of not only the dinosaurs, but as I mentioned, 70, 75% of all species right. on the planet. Is that true or not? And what was the actual cause? 
So some people suggest, oh no, it was a lot of volcanism going on at that time period that maybe the volcanoes are which actually... Which there was. Which the volcanoes are actually are the primary you know, factor that wiped out the dinosaurs, not the asteroid impact. So there's been a little bit of an argument, if you want to say, or mm -hmm. tension back and forth in the literature. Now this study is, kind of looks at it from a slightly different angle. And, and Robert, you can explain this, but yep. one of the... The reasons why we think this is the location of the asteroid that did do in the dinosaurs is because it's in a rich sulfur area. It's in a rich sulfur area. It's in a rich silica area. So why would the sulfur then uh, be important in terms ah, of the extinction of the dinosaurs? Because sulfur, when it's kicked up into the atmosphere, often combines with water. And it doesn't just combine with water. It chemically alters the water into sulfuric acid or sulfurous acid. And both of the bottom line, you had acid rain after this impact on a global scale, not just a little bit blowing over into Canada. <laughs> That's a 70s reference, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the other, and the other thing to note here is, and this is related directly to this study that was published recently, is if you kick up a bunch of dust, like silicate dust, uh -huh. And that goes into the upper atmosphere. So that stays in the upper atmosphere for years. Years. In and fact, the numbers yeah. they give here are like in the order of 15 years or so. And because of that, that gives you this global cooling event. And they estimate it from modeling, which is always, there's an uncertainty on every modeling. Right. The modeling would show a decrease in the overall temperature of the Earth on the order of 15 degrees Celsius. Now, Right now, with climate change, one of the things we're trying to prevent, and there was a story that came out recently about this, is we're trying to prevent a one and a half degree change in Celsius, and they said we're going to hit that limit sometime in the year 2029. And at that point, that's the supposed point of no return where we just can't prevent you know, this runaway effect happening. Right. Well, here we're looking at a temperature difference 10 times greater than that. 15 degrees. So you can imagine what kind of impact that would have on here on the Earth at that time. And one of the things they look at is you got these fine silicate dust that's been ejected essentially into the atmosphere. Yep. That's going to reduce dramatically the amount of sunlight that reaches the surface of the Earth, essentially halting all photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. this, this will occur up to an order of two or three years or so. Right. So you can imagine that if the sun you know, can't produce enough light for that period of time, all the plants start dying. Well, what was one of the sources of food for some of the dinosaurs was, was plant life. Was plant life, and, and not only the dinosaurs, other creatures, other as, creatures well, as well, yeah. which would explain the seventy percent extinction rate. There you go, and, and yeah, and I, I always like putting pointing out because that sounds just horrible. Seventy percent of life on land and ocean went extinct, and that just sounds horrible. There's one extinction event that happened way earlier than that that wiped out like ninety percent. Life almost ended, folks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that is that's like I've heard you know numbers of ninety to ninety five percent of yeah. all life went extinct at one point. It's yeah. When you realize that this was a, this was not the worst such event, is, which is kind of what I'm getting at. But of course, this you event know, this is bad enough. Yes, and but this in, this event was important from the point of view it allowed mammals mammals to evolve to the point where they turn into humans like us. Right. And that's the important kind of, if you go backwards in time, right, and how we end up being here, that's an important step it's along the way. the important thing to us. To us, yes, <laughs> definitely. But the tie-in here to North Dakota, which you might say, well, how does, you know, Mexico tie into North Dakota, is you can see on the image taken in the right, this was an image taken out in the western part of the state in the Badlands areas, and okay. there are a lot of remains, you know, dinosaur fossils and so on. Yeah. And that pink layer that you see there, which is just above the North Dakota label, that's why I put it there to begin with, that pink layer is what was deposited from the, from the impact, impact of the asteroid. Yep. So you can actually detect the silicate dust that's in that layer and above it that was deposited mm -hmm. in those 20 and, years or so after the impact. And there's a reason we think it kicked the dinosaurs out of the pool as well, is there are dinosaur fossils below that layer, and there are none above. And yes, Wonder Goon, that earlier extinction was called the Great Dying. Yeah, for obvious but, reasons. For obvious reasons. Yeah. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's a distinct layer. As you can see, it looks completely different from the, the layers around it. And when you add in that there's dinosaurs below it, 
and nothing, no dinosaurs above it, period. And it's like, holy crap, something happened. So, something big. So if, if that early extinction, the great dying, if that would have wiped out 100%, then in the future, some life form from another planet came and visited the Earth, they would call that game over. Game over. Because <laughs> that would have been the end of it, right? Over. Nothing left at that Nothing. point. Now, this actually, one of the things we talked about already today is plate tectonics and the impact of what that would alter in terms of the helium-3 to helium-4 ratio and so right. on. And when you think about plate tectonics, it's amazing. How many planets other than the Earth, Robert, in our solar system have evidence, direct evidence, for recent plate tectonics? Uh, the Earth. Uh, that's it. one than... other world that has maybe evidence for it, and that's Jupiter's moon Europa. But that's it. There, there is no evidence uh, of tectonics on any other body. In fact, the book Rare Earth, which describes the fact that, you know, the chance of life evolving to the point where they're intelligent like us, mm -hmm. that probability is extremely low when you factor in all the things that had to go right. right. You, know, you had to have a moon, you had to have a Jupiter, you know, all these kind of things. And there's a big, long, you know, uh, a thought process of why each of these points are important. But one of them is plate tectonics. Plate tectonics. And the reason why, folks, is it has to replenish the gases, the nitrogen in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide levels of the atmosphere. All of these things are replenished through volcanism, through plate tectonics. Right. Now, what's so, the one planet in our solar system that's like the Earth, Robert? Size and gravity and all that wise, yeah. Venus. So it's like our twin planet. Twin. It's often called the twin planet. Except when you go there and land on its surface, you'll find temperatures in excess of 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. It's our evil twin. <laughs> it's, like, it's like our own natural oven, you see? You could stick right. a nice pepperoni pizza there and be done in a few minutes. Yep. And you wouldn't have to burn, yeah. use electricity or anything else to power it, you see? In fact, it'd, it'd burn quicker than it would get done, if that makes any sense. Now, if you turn to our slide, you can see why we're mentioning Venus and also plate tectonics. And it's this recent study. We thought that Venus was one of these planets, as Robert alluded to, that did not have tectonic, tectonic activity yeah. through its whole life. And now there's evidence that suggests, well, some modeling, I guess, would be a fairer way of saying it. Some right. mo modeling that suggests that there may have been plate tectonics early on in the history of Venus itself. And I mean, right. you know, three and a half billion years ago to four and a half billion years ago, there was plate tectonics. And right. then it stopped. So it would be like it is today, except and it had an earlier part of plate tectonics activity. And we call that a stagnant lid because right. the bottom line, the heat can't percolate out. It has to be conducted or, or uh, radiated out. So, so how, yeah. did they, how did they figure all this out? So the, they, we know the atmosphere composition of Venus today. We've sent probes to Venus, for example, right? So we have an endpoint. Yeah, so Pioneer Venus, you know, that was in orbit around Venus for many years as a NASA mission and it sent probes that went down through the atmosphere. The Soviet Union at the time launched, had landers that landed on the surface of Venus and so on. So we know the atmosphere of, the, of Venus pretty well. And we're going back in a few years from now to study it even more so. Right. And one of the things you can do is take the composition of the atmosphere now, work back in time and see, can I make a Venus such that it reproduces what I see around me today? Mm -hmm. And you want to mention what that discovery was, which is based, this paper is based on. And that discovery says that it needed plate tectonics, that very short-lived tectonics at that. Um, so basically for a while, Venus had plates that were floating around, moving around on its mantle, uh, kind of like Earth. And that was outgassing enough CO2 and nitrogen that then you can reproduce the levels of such gases that you see in the atmosphere today. Right. So if you, you run some model, let's say, for early on in the formation of Venus without plate tectonics, all of their modeling suggested that you can't get the same atmosphere as we have on Venus today. It does not work. It doesn't work. And that's, I mean, you get CO2 from two sources, really. You get it from biological activity or you get it from vulcan volcanic activity. So... The heavy envelope of CO2 gas, which is the predominant gas in Venus's atmosphere, came from one of those two sources. So Yeah, so you, and you can't have plate tectonics for the whole life of the planet like we essentially have here on Earth. Because we'd see it now. Right. 
and you look on the evidence, I mean, how do you see the surface of Venus? Venus is perpetually cloud cover, is that we've sent up the Magellan spacecraft in the 1990s, and that used radar to map the surface of Venus. Right. So we can look at land formation that way, and there is no evidence of plate tectonics from that mapping. There and of go. course, there are volcanoes. In fact, there are lots of volcanoes on Venus, but we just don't have the plate tectonics like we have here on Earth. Right. In other words, the crust is a solid piece. It's not broken up into plates like Earth is. So, yeah. Uh, and there's no active volcanism evident right now. So the atmosphere can't have been recharged recently by volcanic activity, although there's some debate on that. Right. In fact, so, if there is a lot of uh, plate tectonics, then there, the atmosphere can be different than what it is today. Absolutely. If it's recent, ongoing, like it is here on Earth. Absolutely. And if the other predominant theory is, is that Venus's surface is completely resurfaced, in other words, the crust rolls over and is uh, uh, turned over and churned back down into its mantle and a new surface appears, uh, we would expect to see much higher rates of CO2 because, yeah, even higher, <clears throat> because it would be this catastrophic event that would just outgas all kinds of CO2. So an interesting then a slant on this is because plate tectonics here on Earth is associated with life, mm -hmm. one would wonder if Venus had plate tectonics, even though it was you know relatively short period of time, quote unquote short, you know a billion years or a so, billion years. was life able to get a foothold like it has on Earth, and would there be remains of that life on the surface today or underneath the surface? Right. I, and I got to admit, I kind of wish they wouldn't go there. Um, you know, with Venus at least, there's almost no way we're going to find such evidence. Um, it would have been such short-lived that there probably is no chemical tracer if Venus's surface does periodically re if Venus does periodically resurface itself. All such evidence is gone, melted away essentially, and just several other factors. So. I'm going to be a negative Nelly here and say there, there's no way we're going to be able to prove or even find evidence one way or another. So it's going to remain in the realm of speculation. But tying life, potential life on the planet, that helps the funding agencies. I was about say. to say, that makes people go, hey, we ought to go there and find out. <laughs> Open up the purse string a little, as yeah, they loosen, say. Right? Loosen, loosen up loosen, those purse yeah. strings a little. So I, I get it, but at the same time, I've got to come down on the negative Nelly side and say, you know, not everything has to be tied to life. <laughs> now, when we think about life here on Earth or we think of the possibility of life having a rose somewhere else, like on Venus or on Mars or whatever, I mean, all of that is based on the fact that we can explore our solar system and see where, mm -hmm. which places were hospitable to life as we know it. Right. Of course, we don't know really the condition of hospitable to life that we don't know, right? Right. So we always have to keep an open mind in that sense. You know, I, I sit here and have to have to admit there is the possibility there are life is a type of life we haven't discovered yet, even on our own planet. You know, not everything has to be the double helix of DNA. Not everything has to be based on thiols and on sulfur but carbon you know, chemistry. But you know. but we probably could argue that if there is life, it's probably not it's made up of more things than just hydrogen and helium. Absolutely. I will definitely agree there. It has to be made up more than hydrogen and helium. Now, we know that hydrogen and helium were produced in the oven of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. But the other things that we know that it's, life depends on, the existence of carbon, the existence of iron, and so on, and that's right. life as we know it here, including ourselves, those things weren't created in the beginning of the universe. Those were created in stars. In stars. And in particular, stars when they explode, like supernovae. So if you want to go to our, our next sort of slide that we have here, next story. So this is an interesting, what we call a supernova remnant. So this is the leftover debris from a massive star that exploded back in the year 1006. Or that's when we saw it. That's when we saw it, yeah. <laughs> We're not worrying about the time delay effect here. But that's when the, yeah. the signature, the light from the explosion reached the Earth. Now... The interesting thing about it, so you think it's a massive star, but it turns out that actually there is evidence that there isn't a pulsar at the center. We're going to get into that later. This is actually supernova from a type 1a. 
So it is oh, actually okay. a white dwarf now so white from dwarf. studying it. Right? Went boom. But you don't know, right? You have to do detailed studying, right. right? When you see a supernova. Well, that would explain the shape of the, the nebula. Well, the thing to note here is this was actually observed way back in the year 1006. And did you notice, Robert, that nowadays, you know, for years like 1006, we used to say AD 1006. <laughs> yeah. And now we say it's 1006 CE, the common era. Common era. So yeah. when did that switch happen, by the way? Uh, I'm not sure because I'm not, uh, I'm not a historian. Yeah. But it, uh, it's been a long time coming. There, there are yeah. a lot of people for since like the 60s even, 60, 50s and 60s, who were bucking for decoupling from B.C. and A.D. Yeah, because I know if you're prior to the year zero now, it used to be B.C., now it's B.C.E., before BCE, the Common Era. Before Common Era, yep. In fact, there's actually a grammar mistake on the plaque that's on the Apollo 11 lunar module, the part that was left on the oh. moon. Do you, do you, did you, have you heard about that? I have not heard about that. Yeah, because it states the year, and it's uh, the year 1969, and then it goes 1969 A.D. A.D. is put before the year. When uh, the years are B.C., then that's put after the year. Okay. So it should have been A.D. 1969. 69. So they got that wrong. I've been getting that wrong for years myself. But 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 now it's CE, so we'll have to yeah. go up there someday, scratch off the A.D. and put CE after, yep. you see? Then everything will be what well, we we've have. located most of the sites <laughs> thanks to the the lunar reconnaissance mission. So now the interesting thing about supernovae in general is that whether it's from the collapse of a massive star or it is a white dwarf, so it's a, the end product of a low mass star that accumulates enough material to drive its mass larger than what we call the Chandrasekhar limit, which is mm -hmm. 1.4 times the current mass of our sun. That star is unstable, blow up as this right. type 1a supernovae. Uh, whether you're talking about either type, these supernovae, they produce a lot of these heavier elements during the explosion. So right. the energy of the explosion, some of it goes into the formation of you know, the things that we need in our body. Because right? anything heavier than iron has to be produced by pumping it full of neutrons. Right. And that is, cannot be done in the heart of a star because you have to add energy to produce anything heavier than iron. Now, it wasn't that long ago that people thought every heavy element beyond iron in the periodic table had to be formed in a supernova explosion. Right. Today, we know that's not the case. Now, we speculate that, you know, the merging of two neutron stars can produce things like gold, for example. Like gold. Yeah. So that gold, you know, that's in those bars that's hidden underneath your bed at your house, Robert. Right. Those atoms were once inside, you know, created in the collision of neutron, neutron stars. Neutron stars. Yeah. So that's... Well, the reason is, is because that's going to create a high neutron flux into the surrounding material, which is going to add energy to the nuclei. Exactly. Now, this particular supernova remnant is, is interesting because, because the progenitor, that is when the star exploded, it was actually recorded here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So over a thousand years ago, and you can see the countries there listed, uh, people in China and Japan and so on, actually saw the appearance of a new star in the sky. In fact, it was observable on the order of three years. That's incredible. That to me is just wow. So we should call this object the boat, the brightest of all time when it comes to supernova, you <laughs> say? Because yeah. the, the reason I'm saying that is usually a supernova comes into existence, it brightens rapidly, and then fades over the course of a few days. So that this one was visible for three years, it did not fade like the ones we experience, have experience with. Now, this star that exploded is approximately 6,500 light years away. Right. So that means traveling at the speed of light, it took 6,500 years for the uh, sign of that explosion to reach the Earth in the year 1006. Yep. So it's incredible when you think about it. When you, when you think about it, that would have been about the foundation of writing. Yeah, and the other thing to note, <laughs> right, and the thing to note here is imagine if you were a heck of a lot closer to the star when it oh, blew up, how bright it would be. No, thank you. Yeah. But it would have been bright. Extremely luminous, as we say. Yeah. Now, the image that you see here is actually a combination of data taken from two different sources. Most of the image is taken from Chandra, which is an X-ray observatory that we have orbiting the Earth that, that NASA put up several mm -hmm. years ago. But the other thing that's new here is the image that's taken by the Imaging X-ray Polymetry Explorer Satellite, the XP uh, mission. 
And that's kind of that little piece you see in the upper left. It's one that has these bars that are drawn there. And what's interesting about that mission is the data allows us to look at the polarization of the X-ray photons. Mm. So you have this additional information about how things are polarized. So for those who don't know, Robert, would you like to explain a little bit about the polarization? Okay, I can explain a little bit. Polarization basically means that the wave, because light is a wave, and the waves oscillate in a certain direction. And if you polarize it, all of the waves are essentially, or most of them, are oscillating in the same direction. And so by studying that, we can get hints into electric fields and magnetic fields in the, the source region. And what's a common thing we use today to think about polarization of light that people may wear? Oh, well, that's sunglasses. Yeah. You want, you want those polarized because then they block out most of the, the bad light. Right, so you get scattered light, let's say, from the surface of a lake or a rock. And, and that's... that's naturally polarized at that point. Right, and so that polarized glasses will allow you to block a lot of that extra light out so you don't get blinded by the, this kind of stuff. So yep. it's a great benefit, and I think that's Neat where people stuff. have the most um, you know, experience, with, experience it, yeah. with is yeah. the polarized sunglasses. So yes, so the polarization is telling us information about the alignment of the magnetic fields that are trapped inside of this leftover debris from the explosion of this massive star in this so-called supernova remnant. And the Chandra image it looks kind of like little bunches all over the little place. Bubbles, yeah. So inside of the supernova remnant, there are areas or localized regions where the magnetic field is kind of disordered all over the place. But then associated with it on the scale of the, the supernova remnant itself are the magnetic field lines, which is what the XP image is all about, showing us that the magnetic field lines are oriented in such a way that they point away from the site of the explosion of the supernova. That that's is, they're, they're pointing more or less away from the center outwards. And that's something that we've never seen before. This is all new yeah. data. And so there's like this ordered, mm. overall ordered field on large scales, even though you have disorder on small scales. Overall, you got this ordered field in terms of the explosion, how the explosion itself happened, and in terms of which direction that material is being thrown outward. So to use an analogy, you've got a lot of trees that are growing completely disordered where the seeds fall, but you've got a forest. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so you have a boundary so to the boundary system condition. of trees. Yeah. Exactly nice. right. So this provides you know detailed images about this type of supernova remnant, and, of course, they're looking at other ones as well to see if it's just this one that shows this type of alignment. And you might wonder, where does the light come from? In this case, most of the light is from electrons, charged particles spiraling around magnetic field lines. They emit right. what we call synchrotron radiation. They, they emit x-rays. So, so, and that, that's kind of, this, the, that's where you're seeing it. You, you get x-rays from hot gas or from electrons spiraling in a magnetic field. And by so, looking at the polarization, yeah. that can directly tell you which way the magnetic fields are aligned. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can get these type of measurements that you see here. And I, I mentioned that this one looked like, should have been obvious, it was a type 1A. And that's because it is spherically symmetric, which I'm, I'm mentioning that to segue into our next slide. If you're ready for it. We're ready for it. And this okay. is a different type of supernova remnant. This is the one that's produced by a massive star. star. And notice the difference. No sim symmetric, nothing symmetric about it. It's just looks like what you'd expect from an explosion. Now, coincidentally, this object is also 6,500 light years away. Oh, really? Yeah. And was observed at almost the same time. And you can, you can actually, yeah, so this, the star that exploded that produced the supernova, that was also seen by people here on the mm -hmm. Earth at the time, and this was in the year 1054, so nearly 1,000 years ago. Right. So if you were around at that time, you, know, you could have seen the one that happened in the year 1006. And then seen this one. And then seen this one, you know, 40-some years, years later to yeah. see the, the one that produced the Crab Nebula. That would be neat. And then in recent times, we've been waiting 400 years for the next supernova. For the next supernova, yeah. And yeah, have fun waiting for that, right? You, you know. Come on, Beetlejuice. <laughs> But this, the images, the two of them that you see here, the one on the right is data taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. So once again, we're using the latest, greatest infrared telescope in space to kind of look at the different discoveries that it's making and see how they compare to what we knew before. And the image on the left is from the Hubble Space Telescope. 
And if you look at the James Webb Space Telescope, especially near the center, you get this effect. It almost looks like a disk that's nearly edge on, and it's sort of in the whitish color that they right. use for the color coding. And if you look very carefully, there's actually a white spot near where the center of that edge on disk like structure should be. Is and that the pulsar? That is the neutron star, which is what? seen by Earth as a pulsar. That's yeah. the beast that was created in the heart of the supernova explosion. Nice. And anytime you see a neutron star, you know that's coming from, of course, of an exploded star a, at a the massive, end of its life. Yeah, a massive star that yeah. has ended its life. Now, there are rare cases where people suggest you could have several white dwarfs that come together that merge mm -hmm. that ultimately would create maybe a neutron star and you get a supernova explosion. I would bet those lean more towards type 1A and blowing themselves completely apart. Though. Yeah, well, that's what type 1As do is they completely right. destroy themselves. Uh, people, you know, they're trying. There's a lot of oddballs in this science of supernovae, right? Not right. everything conforms to the exact, you know, properties that all the other supernovae have been observed to do, right? In terms of right. the characteristics. And how do we tell the difference between type one A and type two and the other types of so? How do we know that it's this type of supernova or that type of supernova? Yeah. So when a massive star blows up, what's in its outer atmosphere is hydrogen. Hydrogen. And for when you look at a white dwarf, there is no hydrogen. Right. So when these stars blow up, you're not going to see any signature due to hydrogen. In fact, you see carbon most of the time. Yeah, so you can look mistaken. at the detailed uh, appearance of the spectra of these objects, mm -hmm. and you can classify them that way. So when you see a supernova, where if you're looking at a galaxy tonight and you say, hey, there's a new star-like thing that I see you know, near the center of the galaxy, it may be a supernova. So you compare it, hopefully, to an image you had taken prior, let's say a week earlier, and you don't see that same object then you don't know which type of supernova is going to be until you get somebody, if you can't do it, to take a spectrum, spectrum. of that object, yep. and then you'll know. And, and hence why I keep harping on spectra, which is why I ask, you know, that is the way that we actually get information and can say what we say, you know, this is the case, is because of those spectra. And we mentioned from the last example that we get synchrotron emission from charged particles sprawling around magnetic field lines. The same is for the Crab Nebula supernova mm -hmm. remnant. In fact, the synchrotron emission not only comes out in the radio, it comes out in other shorter wavelengths, including the infrared. In the infrared and X-rays. And X-rays. Right is, down to X-rays. and Yeah, so, so it can yeah. go across the whole electromagnetic spectrum, which is interesting when you think about that side yeah. of things. But the Crab Nebula, it's bright enough. You can see that in an amateur-sized telescope. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you only need, I think, about a four-inch. Yeah, or, or smaller if you're in a dark site. Bright. You know, a two-inch refractor would be able to pick that up. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a bright target, and it's in Taurus. It's yeah. in the bull. So it's actually fairly easy to spot because it's not too far away from the Pleiades cluster. Yeah, because it was first, you know, catalog as mm -hmm. in the Messier catalog. In the Messier catalog. It's M1. M1. It's M1. It's his first, it's his first not comet. Right. So Charles <laughs> Messier is a French astronomer who went around, I think it was in the 1700s, was it? 1600s, late 1600s. Yeah, believe, yeah, and so what he did was try to catalog all the things that looked like a comet because he was interested in discovering comets. Yep. So anything that looked cloud-like or nebulous-like to him, he wrote down the position of these objects so that the next time that he scanned the sky and came across one of these objects, he would check his catalog to say, okay, is that not a comet? Is it just right. a cloud-looking-like thing in the sky? And I always like telling the story. He wanted to be famous for being a comet hunter. Instead, what he's famous for is his list of 110 objects yeah. that are not comets. Right, non-comet <laughs> discoveries. <laughs> he, he's not remembered for his comets he found, which he found a lot. Yes. Uh, he's remembered for his list of not comets. <laughs> right. And the other thing is about this object is we, there's been images, photographs taken, you know, 50 years ago. And mm -hmm. you can take an image today using the same telescope and camera. And it's changed. And it's changed. In fact, it has gotten larger. So this object is expanding with time because of the debris that was hurled outwards in all different directions from mm -hmm. the site of the explosion has reached escape velocity, essentially, of this object. And in fact, you can see right around the pulsar, you can see it sweeping through the dust, its magnetic field sweeping through the gas and dust that's there. You can actually see waves and ripples going out from it. It's, this is a nice object. It is, and from the rate of expansion and get, with an estimate of how far away it is, you can actually calculate, for example, how many kilometers per second is that debris moving, and that's right. on the order of over a thousand kilometers per second. second. 
Yeah. So it's amazing. And it's been, you know, nearly a thousand years since. Right. So not much to stop you in space once you get going. Exactly. And the important thing about this, of course, is that new stars can form from this debris. Absolutely. In fact, the first generation of stars that ever formed would be made up essentially of hydrogen and helium. Right. And so when you, if you wondered about our own sun, for example, is it a first generation star? Well, is there anything in our sun that's beyond hydrogen and helium when you think yes. of, for example, the periodic table? And it's full of stuff, right? It's full of stuff. There's calcium, magnesium, and sodium, and carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. There's all kinds of stuff. The list is almost endless, but not right. quite. Not quite. And that tells us then that our sun is not a first generation star. In fact, it is probably an nth generation of star, and nobody knows what that N is. It could be right. five, could be six, could be seven. But we know that our sun then was not in the first population of stars to ever form in our universe. Right. And we're thankful for that because we are formed from the leftover The debris leftovers of this. Of, of bygone stars that once existed, right, went supernova and blew their guts, for lack of a better word, out <laughs> into space. And then new objects like planets and, and suns form from that material and eventually including our own sun and planet yep. Earth. So the iron that's in our blood, for example... Was in that, the heart of a star. Yeah, that did not exist in the early universe. That was made inside of a star. And so we wouldn't that's, be here for the fact that stars have lived and died. Right. And so if you don't think there's any connection with us in space, you know, ah, why study space? It's a waste of mon money. It has nothing to do with things on Earth. That's where you came from. To study space is to study your origin. Right. So Absolutely. They go hand uh, It's hand. great stuff. Now, speaking about neutron stars, the next kind of story that I noticed that was available here that just came out recently is about a kilonova. Now, what is a kilonova? Do you want to explain that, Robert? Well, we've kind of mentioned type 1a and type 2 supernova where a star, massive star explodes or a white dwarf explodes. But there is the kilonova, which is when two neutron stars collide. So neutron stars are the remnants of these big, massive stars. They form, at the end of their life, either form a neutron star or a black hole. And so this kilonova are when two of those neutron stars come into contact with each other, and who knows what happens, to be honest, uh, other than we do know that a lot of light is produced, and a lot of it is in the gamma ray and X-ray parts of the spectrum. Now, we have direct evidence for the collision or merging of two neutron stars. And that evidence mm -hmm. was collected relatively recently. Yep. And that's through the detection of gravitational waves. Gravi gravity waves, yep. So uh, LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, that detected uh, gravitational waves first in 2015, published a paper in 2016. One of the sources that have been detected since that time has been the merging of two neutron stars. And how do we know this? Well, from the release of the gravitational waves, right. these, the, the uh, progenitor of the gravitational waves, whether it's two black holes that merge or two no neutron stars or maybe a black hole and a neutron star, they produce gravitational wave of a certain type, a certain form, as mm -hmm. we say. And so by detecting the gravitational waves that arrive here on Earth, we know then what produce those waves. Each one has kind of a unique, each circumstance that produce gravitational waves produce a certain wave form. And so it's a matter of just taking what you observe, fitting your library of templates of different situations through modeling, using stuff like the general theory of relativity to say, hey, that came from the merging, not of two black holes, but of two neutron stars of a certain mass range. So, so it's kind of like taking a spectrum. It's kind of like taking a spectrum <laughs> in that sense. And in this particular case, uh, so the setup is when, when the gravitational wave detectors are running, and a gravitational wave is detected, then an alert goes out. Right. And they can give a rough idea of what direction to point, a, let's say, another telescope, like an optical telescope or whatever, in a certain region of space to see if they see anything new. And in this particular case of the gravitational wave that was detected a couple of years back, when people pointed to telescopes in that direction, they saw a signature, a brightening of an object at optical wavelengths and other wavelengths as well. And so we actually saw this using optical telescopes. We've had images taken with the Hubble Space Telescopes and so on. So we know that the merging of these two objects produce electromagnetic radiation. Right. 
And that's actually what I was kind of getting right. at is, is we verified the gravitational wave detection, in fact, because we then saw it. Now, that you have to contrast, too, that if you had, let's say, two black holes that ultimately spiraled closer and closer together and then merged, that would also produce a burst of gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. But if there was nothing around those black holes... They would, you would see nothing? You would see nothing at any wavelength of light you would look at. There would be no mm -hmm. electromagnetic signature. But there, of course, would be that gravitational wave that we would detect, that burst of wave. And by fitting that waveform to a model that shows you, okay, given the certain masses of these black holes that we have when they merge, we can see if anything relates closely to that detected gravitational wave. And that's why we could say, oh, yeah, the one black hole was 20 times the mass of the sun and the other one was 50 times the mass of the sun or whatever. Right. So that's how we get evidence like that. But otherwise, we wouldn't even know that object existed, that those two black holes merged because there was no signature that we could detect with this traditional telescope like optical right. or x-ray or radio or whatever. Now, if they had material around them, all bets are off because that material is going to light up like a galaxy, to be honest. <laughs> That brings up, the, you know, kind of a bit of a misconception that people have. They say, oh, how do you detect uh, black holes? Well, we detect the light that comes from them. But what we really mean, because we're being sloppy in our words, is that we detect light coming from the material that lies outside the black hole. Right. Because immediately people think black holes give off light. But light cannot escape within a certain distance of the center of a black hole. Mm -hmm. you know, from the point of view of general relativity, in other words, with the presence of mass, it warps space and affects time. Inside a certain distance to the black hole, space has warped in on itself. So if you're inside that space, even if you were a beam of light, you can't get out to the outside right. universe. You're trapped forever inside the black hole in that sense. Now all directions are time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, so in this particular case then, with the collision or merging of these neutron stars, what this paper was looking at is what kind of energy would be given off by these neutron stars, like the one that was detected in gravitational waves back in the 2017. Right. And some of the things that can be given off by these includes you know, burst of gamma ray energy. Now, gamma rays are the shortest wavelength photons that exist. And because the energy relates to the frequency of the photon such that the higher frequency or shorter wavelengths have more energy, gamma rays, because of their very short wavelengths, they pack a powerful punch in terms of energy. Right. And so if you have a lot of gamma rays that's being emitted from this type of object, the merging of these neutron stars, which we call a kilonova, if this object is close enough to the Earth, it can bombard, if you like, our upper atmosphere and strip away things like the ozone layer and essentially, it can extinguish life as we know it here right. on Earth. I mean, to put it in perspective, gamma rays have enough energy to actually split atoms, to split the nuclei of atoms. Molecules are going to be no objective. They're going to split those, break up molecules like go into life without even losing enough energy to notice. Now, as you see so. on the artist drawing on the right, during this merging process, there are like two jets that are created, one going up, essentially one going down. And the, the mm -hmm. modeling that was done and the impact of what it would have on Earth was always done from the point of view, if you tilt the plane that represents the disk at which these two neutron stars are spawning around each other so that the jet is pointed directly towards us, then you get sort of maximum impact of the energy released during the merging process, during the kilonova event. That, that's being at the head of the hammer. Yeah, so it's like the, the analogy you could use, I guess, would be if somebody was shining a laser beam directly at your eyes versus just looking at a standard incandescent light bulb, for example. Right. And which effect would be greater? Obviously, there's a difference there. Now, what this paper did is they modeled what happens if the jet is not pointed directly at you but is off by several degrees. Will that still affect the Earth if one exploded nearby, if one of these <laughs> kilonova events happened nearby? And the answer seems to be that if, these, uh, if an object like this was in about 36 light years of the Earth, that it would strip away our atmosphere, essentially. Right. And it would cause you know, essentially a mass extinction here on the Earth. 
Thirty so Robert, feet, that's a big chunk of space. So Robert, this is another thing we have to worry about. The universe really is out to get us, folks. <laughs> you know, if an asteroid doesn't hit us and we can't redirect it with the technology that we have, there's a mass extinction event, right? Right. Or if somehow a super flare is emitted from our sun and strip away our atmosphere completely, then you have, what, five minutes left to hold your breath before it's game over? Right. So there's all kinds of things, you know, we're just ignoring things that are caused by humans, whether it's nuclear war or something else that ultimately changes life in a fundamental way going forward in the future. It seems like there's a lot of stuff out there that's dying to kill us for just, use of terms. Just looking for a, <laughs> for a way, you know, yeah. Just looking for a way. Anyways, ending on that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> we thank you for watching this podcast. If you're interested in science of any type or mathematics or maybe in arts, I know we like to have everybody in higher education, and that includes also coming here to the University of North Dakota. So if you can, you know, and you can't come here, take classes online, or come here and visit us here on campus and take classes, whether in the yep. STEM field or arts, humanities, you name and, it. And if you're in the area, come by and see us. Come by and say hello. Now, we always end our podcast, usually with a quote. Last day, there was an exception. We did an excerpt from Dan's book. Yep. But today, we will do a quote. This quote, we, we talked uh, just a few seconds ago about frequency. Ah. This quote is from Heinrich Hertz. And you recognize the surname Hertz. That's the name we use for a unit of frequency. Of one, frequency. One cycle yeah. per second is at one Hertz. And it really hurts. <laughs> so Sorry. So, that was a bad one. <laughs> so on the radio, we can talk about, you know, like kilohertz or megahertz, right? On, on the FM dial, it's megahertz. On the AM dial, it's kilohertz, for example. Right. And so we use that in common language. But the quote from Heinrich Hertz, now, he lived in the 1800s. Yeah, he only lived to be at the age of like 36 or so. I know. Yeah. He suffered from migraines, I believe mm -hmm. the story is, and had an operation done to relieve him of his migraine pain. That operation was not successful. Right. And I don't know what they did exactly. They opened up his head. Right. And you can imagine in the 1800s what that would be like. Uh, I don't, yeah. I I don't, don't want to imagine. <laughs> Now, the quote from Heinrich Hertz, so he did experiments that actually proved that radio waves did exist, and they are described by, you know, Maxwell's equations, you know, all mm -hmm. of heavy sides work, theoretical work, and so on. And that quote is, I do not think that radio waves I have discovered will have any practical application. Wow. <laughs> you know, that's one thing you never do is make predictions. Right. Because chances, especially not about what's going to be useful. Or not. As Yogi Bear would say, you never make a prediction, especially about the future. Right. And with that, thank you very much for <laughs> you listening. Folks.